okay, Americans, most of us don't have a valid passport. We could attribute that to our on average 12 days of annual paid vacation for sure. But traveling abroad has other barriers as well, language. And for the 25% of black and brown Americans, racism and colorism is yet another consideration. Today, my guest is going to share his personal experiences on all of it. His family is from southern India. He grew up in the U.S. and has since been to 78 countries, spending about a month in each place. He's an actor, university lecturer, language trainer, tourism consultant, and smarty pants, because wait for it. (laughs) He has bachelor degrees, plural, from Temple University in Philadelphia in psychology, visual anthropology, I don't know what that is either, but it sounds fabulous. And cognitive neuroscience. And a master's in applied (laughs) linguistics from the University of Portsmouth in the UK. Multilingual, multi-talented, the resilient and ridiculously beautiful Sri Ram Ganeshan. (laughs) Oh, wow. Jeez. (laughs) I should hire you to do all my PR from now on. (laughs) Hey, if it gets me a ticket to India, we can talk. Yeah. (laughs) I was thinking back of when we met, and um, I know it was in Nicaragua, but was it when you, did we meet when you busted your knee? Uh, No, it was after that I had busted my knee, but, uh, well, I did kind of bust my knee when I was surfing one day, so that did happen. So we met, we met in Popoyo. Um, so I just arrived there because I wanted to surf. I had been surfing in Morocco earlier in the year, and it was my first time in my life basically getting on a surfboard. And uh, I wanted to try again, and Nicaragua seemed like an amazing opportunity. So I crossed the border over from Costa Rica, and we met there. That's so funny. And then my husband and I crossed the border from Nicaragua into Costa Rica right after we met. So we kind of switched places. Well, we connected and became fast friends. So obviously that connecting piece is something that you're very natural at. And language is a big part of that because I remember when we went to the restaurant and we were like ordering food and you just started speaking Spanish. And I was like, right on. Okay. (laughs) So what do you feel like you would personally miss out on if you didn't have that language piece of the multicultural connection? Wow, just the ability to connect and relate on an interpersonal level with people, especially when you travel. And I think that um, for me, just the ability to communicate in a different language has just changed my travel experiences and taken them to another level. I mean, to be honest, like Spanish, a lot of us in the US, uh, we study Spanish as a second language in school. I was one of them. Um, Personally, I think in the US, we generally start learning second languages far too late. Um, you know, in the game, usually by middle school or something is when most people, at least in my generation, started studying a second language. So I had done that all through secondary school, sorry, middle school and high school. Sorry, I've been living out of the U.S. for a very long time. So I did it through middle school and high school and then, you know, graduated and then I completely forgot all my Spanish. And it was when I went down to Mexico one summer and, you know, when you have to order food and take a bus and live and do things and essentials, you'll quickly learn again. And what I found is that all of the grammar and stuff was still back there somewhere in the language part of my brain. And then just having to use it every day just gave me the the confidence to speak. And then traveling through Latin America, I gained, uh, I would say, I I would hope a respectable level of fluency in Spanish. So I have friends that I only speak in Spanish with and stuff. And it's just been such a gift to be able to understand different ways of thinking and interact with people in their own language because they can truly express themselves better in their own language. So even if they are trying to speak English for my benefit, there's always something that gets lost in translation. And of course, there is always something that gets lost in translation when I'm speaking Spanish because I'm not a native speaker, but I can at least understand what they mean, even if I can't verbalize myself in in response the same way. I agree. And I think that from my experience speaking Spanish and learning Spanish, it um, gives you insight into how a Spanish speaking person would think. Not just Absolutely. grammar, but like their um, idioms. Absolutely. 
you know, I, I definitely have a few favorites, but, or even here's a good example, like in Spanish, you know how they say no serve para nada, like you're good for nothing. In English, we say right. good for nothing. So that kind of is an insight that we reflect ourselves in terms of value. But in in Latino culture, it's um, how hard of a worker are you? What do you bring? What how Who do you serve? What do you serve? And I love that part of the culture. And so understanding the linguistic piece unlocks an insight into the cultural piece. And, you know, I think also when you're traveling, you're so often exposed to customer service situations. And one of the things that always captured my heart, especially in Mexico, was how people, when you would dine out in a restaurant and you would leave and say gracias, and they would say para servirle, which I just found so beautiful. Instead of just saying you're welcome, de nada or something, it was just such a beautiful, like to serve you, I'm happy to serve you, you know, Mm -hmm. as a way of thanking you for your patronage. I just found it really beautiful and it just took the whole experience of uh, traveling to another level when you can start to understand their way of thinking. Gosh, that's so true. Do you have any favorite idioms in Spanish or any other languages that you find other than para servirle or like that are funny? I mean, I don't know necessarily funny, but how much did you love in Costa Rica? How Everyone would always say pura vida to everything, you know? Yeah. It was like, you would say gracias for a, a mojito and they'd be like pura vida. That would be their response, which is just like pure life. You know, life is meant to be enjoyed and it's blissful and every moment is a gift. And this is what life is about, you know? Yeah. And I think we in, in quote unquote more developed societies, and I really say that in, in with the bunny ears and the quotation marks, because what, you know, if we talk about having infrastructure and nonstop electricity as a sign of development, then... I think cultures, you know, such as Mexico and Costa Rica, where family and community are so important, if we can't look at that from a different angle to see these cultures as being actually developed in their own way, I think we are actually mixing, missing the big picture. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's huge insight. I did love it, how it was your welcome, it was hello, it was goodbye, it was you after you caught a, a good wave, you know, it was all that. I love in um, Mexico as my favorite, uh, they're called modismos, <laughs> idioms, and my favorite is just in case, which it translates for if the flies, por si las moscas. Mm. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, really? I thought I never knew. Yeah, por si las moscas. Take your jacket. Por si las moscas. Oh, wow. Okay. So for most Americans who do learn language later in life, or never at all, um, you know eight languages, you said, at some level. Yes. yeah. Yeah. I would say very fluent in about four and a half of them, I'd say. No, around four or five of them I'm very fluent in, and the other three I'm conversational and can get by. And that's only because uh, those languages are just from countries where I don't really meet a lot of people who speak those languages anymore. And those were languages I learned when I was living in those countries specifically. So over time, of course, like all things, language um, ability starts to depreciate a bit Mm -hmm. if you're not constantly practicing. So but the thing is, if I go back to one of those countries again, it comes back very quickly as well. That's good to know. I think a big barrier for people in the States is part of what you just said is having that immediate application of the language. Um, So they Mm -hmm. just, you know, for them, it's not practical. And then if they don't enjoy it on top of it, if they're not a language nerd, then there's no real incentive for them to learn it. But that being said, these are interesting times. We're in quarantine. We're like, my brain is turning to mush. I am eating excessive amounts of banana bread. What shall I do? I will (laughs) learn a language. So for that person, what would you suggest as the way to get the most traction the fastest in any new language? You know, for me, um, when I started learning some of the more foreign languages to me that weren't necessarily from a culture that I grew up with, or were far reaching for me, one of the the biggest ways of learning that that was beneficial for me was actually something like Rosetta Stone, which was uh, very, very, very integrative. And the whole idea behind Rosetta Stone, I don't work for Rosetta Stone or anything like that. I'm not advertising for them. But for me, it really worked well because they essentially approach language teaching and language learning to the natural way, which is essentially, you know, when we were children and we would look at something and not know the word, our 
caregiver would say that word for us and then it would start to, we would make those connections. We never actually learned what the word for paper is through another language, you know? So what Rosetta Stone does is basically it just puts up images on the screen and then just says words. So you're not actually using a dictionary or translating from one language into another. You're actually learning another language as if you learned your first language. Of course, it's not the perfect way to learn a language. There, there are some, um, you know, things that can be improved on the Rosetta Stone uh, uh, approach as well. But I do think it's a great way to start building vocabulary and start understanding simple sentences and concepts and stuff uh, without having to use English as the intermediary between the two. Yeah, so remove the English and just develop a brain of, you know, if you're learning Spanish, develop a Spanish brain or if you're learning Chinese, a Chinese brain. Totally. And also, incidentally, and I'm just sharing this because I'm really excited about it. I just saw online that Rosetta Stone is offering a lifetime membership. What? For like 80% discount right now. What? Yeah, it's crazy. They're like, they're offering a lifetime membership plus like two different apps or something for like $197 for lifetime to access all their languages and everything. I'm totally going to sign up this week. So oh if there gosh. are any listeners out there who love learning languages, like get on that because that's a steal of a deal. Oh my gosh. I'll make sure to post that this week because this won't air until yeah. later. So it won't be going on when it airs, but wow, that I'm super intrigued yeah, super by that exciting. because yeah, I would love to yeah. learn some more languages. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, language is the key. I mean, we live in a global society today and I think, um, Anglophones, just English speakers in general, we have the gift that people around the world want to learn how to speak English fluently, which is a gift, but then also a curse, because I think in general, it makes us very complacent. And uh, a lot of Anglophones then feel, well, everybody wants to learn English anyway, so why do I really need to make the effort to learn another language? But in this global society that we live in, I feel like it's everyone's duty to make, or at least show their part, that they're part of this global society by trying to communicate interculturally and establish intercultural interactions that are not exclusively in your native language. Absolutely. I'm, I'm super passionate about that. It's really at the top of my things that make me vibrate on a high frequency, but it's also very practical and it can get you out of sticky or awkward situations, which you've mentioned that it's helped you in a few situations. So can you talk about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I lived in Korea, in South Korea in 2008, 2009. And uh, it was actually the first country I lived in on my own as an adult, uh, without my parents attached to me and really going out there and doing my own thing. And uh, I went over there to work starting a musical theater academy over there. And, um, you know, when I moved there, I've always been fascinated by language and culture and travel and stuff. And I, I went full in and I wanted to learn this language. And I started learning the Hangul script. Interesting fact, actually, Korea was one of the first countries in the world with a 100% literacy rate because um, King Sejong, uh, Korean people are very proud of King Sejong because he brought the Korean alphabet to the country. Essentially, he developed this language system because prior to the Hangul alphabet, uh, Korea was using Hancha, which is the Chinese alphabet. And the Chinese alphabet is really not for laymen. It's so complicated. Every word almost has its own character. So your average person couldn't learn how to read. And then King Sejong completely revolutionized the Korean language by developing its own script which then enabled, honestly, anybody um, to medium intelligence would be able to learn Hangul in about two to three hours of concentrated effort sitting down. You could actually start reading words and sentences wow. very, very quickly. And so Korea actually became one of the first countries to have a 100% literacy rate as a result of this. So, I mean, these are just things you would, I, I would never have learned that unless I actually made the effort to learn Korean, you know? And, you know, when I would meet Korean people in any part of the world, when I would talk about these things, they were almost just kind of blown away that I had done this kind of work and that I had made this kind of effort to learn about their culture and their language. And it just gave me such entree into that culture and particularly living in Korea. Um, you know, the United States uh, was heavily involved in the Korean War. So um, South Korea is obviously very pro-American 
and there is a very big American presence in Korea as well, um, particularly in Seoul. There was a huge military base for a very long time. I believe since I left, they moved it elsewhere, but um, there was an area of Seoul called Itaewon, which was kind of the, the Western ghetto. That's what I'll call it. But um, it's basically where all of the military people were hanging out when they weren't on duty. And, um, you know, it was very easy to live in Korea within this bubble where you never actually had to learn any Korean. And I came across so many people who were either there with the military or were English teachers, because that was one of the number one things that people went over to Korea to do. And I met all these English teachers from, from mostly from the United States and Canada, because that's, those were the number one, uh, that was the number one accent group that Koreans desired. But I also met a lot of people from Ireland, from the UK, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. But I found that these people were basically living in these English speaking bubbles in Korea without ever really learning any Korean. And I had met even people who had been living there for like seven to 10 years and they still couldn't read Hangul. Literally, it takes three hours to sit down and learn how to read it. And I realized you've been living here for seven to 10 years, looking at buses, looking at signs, looking at things, not having a clue what's going on around you. And I just found that so fascinating. Um, but I, I really made the effort. I jumped in, did full on Korean classes. Um, achieved probably a, a low intermediate to uh, mid intermediate range in Korean in my in my fluency. And I did a trip once by myself around Korea, um, you know, just grabbed a little backpack and off I went taking a bus to the countryside. And, you know, when you look like me, you know, a, a brown guy bearded, um, it can be sometimes a little bit off putting or worrisome to people who aren't exposed to a lot of different cultures and stuff. And, you know, when you go into the countryside of Korea, um, I often found that people, when they would immediately see me, would they would immediately kind of be taken aback or they, they, they wanted to take retreat and step away. And what I found was when I would speak Korean, um, I remember one time I went to a restaurant and the, the women running the restaurant, I could totally tell that they were open, but they were basically telling me they weren't open because they didn't want me to stay out. <laughs> And then I started speaking Korean and then I, you know, I started asking them, is there another restaurant in the area that maybe I could go to that, that, that is open? I was asking them in Korean in the very polite way to do so. And immediately when they realized that I could actually speak their language and I could read their menus, they immediately said, oh, no, no, you can come in and sit down. And then they basically started, you know, making all of these very unique dishes that you wouldn't normally find in a restaurant that they would normally do for their families. And I ended up being like spoon fed essentially by these <laughs> ajumas. That's what they call them in Korea, like aunties or like, you know, middle-aged women. That's how they refer to them. It's yeah. not nice in Western standards, but um, over in Eastern cultures, they like to be called aunties and this mm -hmm. is the respectful way to do so. And uh, yeah, I just, I just felt so welcome immediately. And I could see all of that, that worry and all of that, aloofness and standoffishness just melt away and I just felt so welcome and I I felt like I really made um, an amazing cultural connection there and also you know they probably had never met an American person who spoke Korean so well before and much less an American person who was not Caucasian who could mm. even speak any Korean so it for them it must have just been the first time as for me the first time to have had such an experience as well so it was just a beautiful moment that I'm going to cherish for the rest of my life, really. <laughs> That's so amazing. That's such a special thing when especially you got the insider experience. And I feel, feel like that's yeah. what language learning gives you is an insider experience. But as a, a brown person, I think that's particularly unique that you went into the situation, recognized they are hesitant towards me at best, afraid of me or racist towards me at worst. But mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to ninja. I'm going to language ninja them and then they're going to love me and then we're going to sit down and auntie's going to feed me and it's going to be so great. And of course, you didn't know that that was going to be the outcome, but I love how speaking a language can bridge those gaps and it's the beginning of overcoming, it can be, some of those things. You've had some experiences with colorism kind of um, inverted in, um, in India where you're living. You're living in Western India. Can you share about that too? Because I found that contrast between the kitchen story and the apartment story pretty interesting. Oh, totally, with pleasure. So colorism is a very intricate, complicated thing. 
Um, India, of course, is a, a, a former colony. So there's a, a strong colonial history here. It was a former colony of, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, much as the United States was as well. And uh, India achieved independence in 1945. But the, the presence of the colonialism is still very much here. And, you know, one of the ways that um, the English colonized particularly over in the East was to essentially divide and conquer the people and make them not trust each other. So essentially, um, people of Indian origin would be mistrustful of people of Indian origin within their own country, but then trust their colonizers far more. And what I often find here in India as a person of Indian origin, I, I was born in India. I mean, I lived here till I was about seven years old. And yes, I did spend most of my life abroad, but I am Indian and I can speak two Indian languages. And what I find interesting is here in Goa, which is a, a very beautiful area on the coast. It's been known for decades as kind of a hippie Mecca. It was, you know, the classic place on the hippie trail when people would make that venture from London all across Central Asia through Iran, Afghanistan. I'm talking about back in the 70s and 60s when um, these countries were extremely peaceful and people would make that that trek all through Central Asia, the Middle East, through Nepal, and then to India. And Goa was kind of the end point of all of that. And it naturally became a hippie Mecca um, over many, many decades. And what I find interesting here is uh, when I would go to look at an apartment or something um, that I would maybe be interested in moving in, into that that the owners or whatever when they would immediately see me they would have negative stereotypes because i'm indian they would immediately think especially as an indian male single um maybe he's gonna i mean i'll just say literally what is going through their minds maybe he's gonna bring hookers over maybe he's gonna create problems for us maybe he's a drug dealer maybe he's gonna be uh you know maybe he's not gonna pay his rent at all maybe he can't even afford the place you know so there's so many stereotypes that immediately come up in their minds but what I found interesting, because I've, I've navigated these, these issues myself often enough here that I know what will win them over. And in this case, um, a Western friend of mine who's been studying Indian classical dance for a very long time, she's from South Africa and Portugal. And the minute that she was with me and the same landlord saw me and her together, I was immediately validated in their eyes because I was then more trustworthy because I had Western acquaintances. Isn't that interesting? And I won't just say Western acquaintances, I'll say white acquaintances. The fact that I had white people who, uh, who accepted me or I was, I had, you know, kindred friendships with uh, Caucasian people or whatever, that it made me more trustworthy in my own country. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if interesting is the, <laughs> the word <laughs> that I would choose, but I love that it is the word that you choose and the perspective that you choose to look on it with. I, it's colorism is just um, something that I wasn't aware of until l later in life. Um, my first experience, I was working at a family owned um, Taiwanese restaurant and I was the only um, white person to be hired. And it, I was kind of a controversial hire. And um, part of that was, you know, the different family members, especially the matriarchal women, um, choosing mm -hmm. whether or not they were going to accept me. As someone who loves culture, I ate it up. Every day I went to work, I was like, this is so fun. They might reject me. They might make me do hard labor. <laughs> I don't care. This is like so exciting. Um, you know, and they definitely talked about me in Mandarin, like to my face. I'm like, y'all, I can read body language. I can see that this is not positive. <laughs> like, but like the process of calling them out and being like, just tell me what you're saying. Like, let's just talk. Let's just like m get through this, whatever, whatever your issue is, let's g let's work through it. Um, but later on, one of the older women came to me and she kept talking to me and or looking at me and talking and then looking at her, uh, friend or other relative and and the other woman was like boo 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 no 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 and then the older woman kept creeping closer and closer to me and then mm -hmm. finally the other woman sighed and said she wants to touch your face and I was like okay that's cool and then she touched my face she got really close to my face and then she touched her own skin and she said "Ooh, black ugly and it in her and her expression when she said it 
she was serious. She wasn't joking. You know how sometimes women make self-deprivating jokes? She was so serious that she was like hated her skin and she wanted white skin. And that was the first time I ever was aware of anything like that. How do you, from traveling, overcome the, like the hatred of both people against themselves and of others and have that perspective of, oh, this is interesting. Oh, let's work through this. Oh, let's connect. How do you keep that optimism? Wow. So you are hitting probably something that, that has been a constant struggle for me in my own life. Actually, that's very prevalent in India as well. Uh, Asian societies in general, they have an obsession with with fairness, we'll say that. So uh, having very white skin or light skin was historically kind of a sign of wealth because that meant you didn't have to work outdoors. It meant that you could lead a life of, of comfort because you, you weren't out in the sun working and so forth. And India also struggles with this very same issue. India is probably one of the most... Um, white obsessed countries in the world uh, so much so that people actually use bleaching creams to bleach their skin to a lighter shade and i travel a lot in india and being of indian origin i mean i tan normally right now i'm darker uh, in skin tone than i would normally be because i'm i'm out in the sun regularly but um when i travel you know i'm out in the sun i love the sun i don't avoid the sun and people from india usually will never stand in the sun or lay out on the beach and stuff that even when I would be out traveling and then I would go home to my family here in India, they would buy me that bleaching cream because they would tell me I was ugly with this skin tone, you know, that I look, I look like a beggar out on the streets is literally what they would tell me in, in our language. And, you know, I think this is part of this issue of the grass is always greener on the other side, you know, because over in, in, in Western cultures, we have people who are, who are very, very fair skinned actually trying to get tans, you know, because they want to be darker and look more bronze and, and have a quote unquote, healthier Mediterranean looking skin tone. So I think, I think the greatest problem is really that, that society ingrains in our heads that, that we aren't good enough as who we are really, and how we were born and the skin that we're, we're given, you know, this is a gift that we live in this body, you know, the, our, our body is a temple for the soul that we house. And it's such a shame that we get socialized to believe that we are anything but perfect exactly as we are. And uh, for me, it's been a great internal struggle living in this culture, uh, being Indian and so forth to kind of break through that and not let that kind of cloud my own judgment or my own self-worth anymore and just be myself and live authentically and really just be comfortable in my skin regardless of what skin tone I'm gonna be. Um, of course it is work though, you know, cause sometimes I do feel like I get I get that negative reaction if I am darker skin from some people. And it happens in terms of casting. You're an actor as well, you know, here in India. Sometimes when you are darker in skin tone, it makes you less hireable as an actor. So um, I do try to keep that in mind sometimes, but I'm never going to be somebody who's going to be putting on bleaching cream on my body to change my skin tone. This is just a line I won't cross. I did do it in the past to make other people happy, but I will never do it again in my life to to make anyone else happy. And, and I've gotten to the point where I feel comfortable in, in my skin. And this is something I wish more people would talk about to actually put the message out there. And it's in the media, you know, to if we could have more actors who 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 are actually beautiful and brown in India up on the screen. If you watch Bollywood movies, actually, the actors that you see in the films are so fair skinned that they almost don't even look Indian anymore. And it basically sets an unreal expectation and desire of beauty or a beauty standard in the larger community's mind that is unattainable and also only leads to self shame. And I think, you know, as a film industry, they have the responsibility, the cultural responsibility to let the people of this country feel good about themselves. Let's have actors up on the screen who look like the majority of this country and let's empower these people and let them feel good about the skin that they're born into. This is the change I would love to see in India, but I think this is a long ways off in terms of travel. Um, I mean, honestly, I think I think um, I've navigated the 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 issue, not issue. I won't call it an issue, but um, you know, being Indian and Western, um, that 
what, what kinds of stereotypes somebody might immediately have based on seeing my skin color. Or if I tell them, uh, it's funny actually, because in the US I often get, get asked, what's your nationality? And this is my number one pet peeve that people say, what is your nationality when what they mean is what is your ethnicity? Yes. What, what, what's your ethnic background? Right. Yeah. Well, my, ma- my nationality is the same as yours. I'm American, I'm a, I'm a US passport holder, you know? Mm-hmm. But my ethnicity is Indian, yeah. So um, what I find interesting is that there I get asked that question, but then also here I'll get asked, where are you from all the time, even though I'm Indian? <laughs> so I, I kind of don't really fit in anywhere as being totally local, which I've learned to embrace as well, that I, I'm just somebody who can, um, fall in and out of cultures and um, I, I look at that as a gift rather than as a curse as maybe I had looked at in the past. Yeah and I think you being able to connect with other people in their language have that relationship your self-acceptance is contagious you know and um, maybe the culture as a whole won't be making any big shifts anytime soon but to take care of yourself and love yourself is maybe cliche, but the start of making those changes and um, having it be contagious by talking with other people. And if that means talking in their language awkwardly, then you just power through it. But to show um, that different mindset, this has been such a cool conversation. I cannot wait to visit you in person. Um, i yeah, we have, I could talk to you forever, but before we go, can you please um, share a short bit about the, um, the El Shaddai Charitable Trust? You wanted our viewer, our listeners and viewers to know about that. Sure. So the El Shaddai Charitable Trust is an organization here in Goa, which is the state that I'm in right now. And what they do is they, they basically create homes for children that are orphaned and give them a happy place to live and give them a second chance at life. Many of these children come from very impoverished backgrounds. Um, They have an incredibly, incredibly transparent, um, how do you say, kind of, they're very transparent about how they use their money and the the money that comes in uh, in terms of charitable donations. And you can find them online. Um, I've sent you the link already. And they do a ton of work here in Goa um, to house children who are either impoverished or uh, are living out on the streets. So they rehabilitate a lot of street children, give them a chance at life, um, give them an education. And uh, a lot of them go on to succeed and and do well living here in Goa. And um, anything that empowers children and gives, you know, children are, are the most vulnerable beings in our society. I mean, they cannot control the circumstance that they're born into and often can't even control anything happening around them. And unfortunately, in a country like India, which uh, does suffer from its ample, uh, you know, level of corruption, plus, you know, there's a lot of poverty. And then given the current situation with COVID, it is actually affecting the people from the middle to lower classes the most. And it's actually been a tremendous burden on them. And um, if people are inspired by this conversation and inspired by maybe helping um, some people who are less fortunate than they are, especially children, I strongly recommend them to get online, check out that website. You can see all of the work that they do. They're an incredibly good organization. Um, they, they operate with both uh, religious and non-religious principles, so it speaks to everybody. And I think um, everyone can relate to their, their mission. It's really a beautiful cause. And I came across several of the, the people working with the charity over my time here in Goa. And the work and the passion that they bring to this um, mission is just incredible. And I want to support them in any way that I can. I don't care to self-publicize or anything like that. But if I can add value to, to the lives of people here that have given me a home in Goa during this whole COVID uh, slow down, that's what I'll call it, rather than a lockdown. Um, that's the greatest thing that I can do. That's awesome. I'll definitely be sharing that so people can check it out. Thank you again. It's always such a pleasure talking with you. That's a wrap, my friend. Likewise, Meredith. Woo. Thank you, Meredith.